Thanks very much for that. And I think it's probably a reflection of the important contribution that uh, IFM has made to innovation in health finance, that IFM is so well represented on, the, on this panel, but also elsewhere in, in this room. And so, uh, Christopher, you've also been involved with IFM, and this was developed, I guess, about 10 years ago. And so it'd be interesting to hear from you. Do you think a structure like IFM could be uh, adapted uh, and used viably today given the more stringent regulatory and capital requirements that uh, it would face? Um, <clears throat> thank you, and, and furthermore, thank you to everybody for, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I, I can answer this question very, very simply and just say yes. Um, but, but, but perhaps I could just spend a couple of minutes just giving you an... an um, an anecdote that even was the product of a of a set of um, issues, and and we were trying to solve those issues, and um, it was it was specifically uh, designed and created um, with that in mind. And so, I I wouldn't necessarily say um, you know take a IFM and press F9, but I but I what I would say is take the the bits of that, that we did with IFIM um, and say, you know, which of those are, are usable. Um, the, 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 the sort of the nuance here is that, it, you know, would governments be able to make long dated multi-year pledges? Could you get through the regulatory side with people like Eurostat and, and all of the rest of it? In truth, um, the one thing I know about governments, and I've had the pleasure of working with them now for, for some 20 years, is um, when they want to do something, they can, um, they can do anything. And when they don't want to do something, they will find a thousand excuses, and, and usually regulation is one of them, that, that they won't do it. So um, let's, not, um, you know, let's not just be constrained by you know, what we might or might not be able to do. If we can create the, the right product, then um, we should, in my view, be able to create the right regulatory framework for that as well. The, the end, well, which, the problem we're trying to solve here is too important. Um, okay, just to expand on that a little bit though, that the, for example, the role of the World Bank as treasury manager, I think that that's been something that in terms of the capital that the, the World Bank has committed to this, that apparently the World Bank has never actually asked IFIM to make the mark-to-market -market contribution is actually required for its cross-currency swaps. And apparently it would be very difficult for IFIM to meet those mark-to-market -market, uh, requirements if it, if it was asked. Is that something that you've looked at? Um, yes. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't want to... Um I don't want to comment um, about a bilateral and private relationship between IFIM and, and, and the World Bank, um, but um, you know any exposures which exist are um, are mark to market exposures backed by sovereign credit. So um, I think the um, you know if you really dig into the risk profile of of, of that analysis, it's um, it's not like this is a um, a highly speculative venture. So that's, that's very helpful. So just to, to, to build on, on the IFM experience a little bit, uh, that in our discussion today, we've had two similar but dis distinct financing challenges, you know, funding pandemic prevention or preparedness and funding response. Uh, could you describe the similarities and differences between the financing tools used for these goals? Um, certainly. So um, the... If, if, and, and if, if I may, I'll, I'll sort of use IFM as, a, as an example here. Um, we were trying to do one thing with IFM, which was initially, which was all about front loading. Um, actually, indirectly, we achieved another thing, which I think is actually turned out to be more valuable for Gavi, which was we created predictability. Um, we created 20 and 30 year predictable, legally binding cash flows. That had never been done before. And if you're in the business of trying to manage a vaccination program or a health system strengthening program, um, or indeed an awful lot of things in the development world, having that predictability has incredible value. It has value because um, 
you know, Gavi can, can write and procure um, ahead of getting cash flow from other organizations because it has that balance sheet. Um, it has value because it knows that there's money that, that it can use in the future. It has value to um, the industry, the vaccine industry, because they know that Gavi has money and has a balance sheet in the future. So um, the fact that we created a mechanism to enable governments to, uh, to give that multi-year um, pledge um, has enormous, enormous present value. Now, if you think about it, in terms of a pandemic prevention, really, um, it's a health system strengthening issue, which is a development issue. And so we have to recognize that we can't solve that in a, overnight. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's another, you know, we had our Millennium Development Goals, and now we have our Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm sure we'll have the even more Sustainable Development Goals or, or whatever in 2030. So this is a, an evolution, and countries are on a path, and, and hopefully things will get better. But what you really need is predictable finance and knowing that there will be work to, I mean, there will be capital to, um, uh, to, um, to fund those, those salaries, the costs of the devices, the, the, the you, can't, you can't just go in and put up a facility um, and then walk out. These things have to be, um, these things have to be looked after on a long-term basis. So we need some long-term predictable cash that is committed that will come for many, many years. And we have an example of that in, in IFM. Um, there were some tweaks around, the, um, around the, um, how we got it off balance sheet, around um, linking it to the performance of the 72 poorest countries of the world and their performance to the IMF. That is more complicated to do in a, in a situation like this, where there are specific hotspots where you need to to do this, it's not necessarily happening in the 72 um, countries. But I would sort of rely on my where there's a will, there's a way kind of comment at the back. Um, the, the, the next thing is, is, is cash. And when you have a pandemic, you need cash. Um, the one thing that I guess the difference here is that, in my mind, between this and insurance is, in insurance, we're dealing with the, as they say here in Washington, the known unknowns. And what we need to have is something that can deal with the unknown unknowns. And the unknown unknowns, what I'm hearing is we need, um, you wake up on a Wednesday, um, something is happening, and, and capital needs to flow very, very quickly. Actually, that, um, forget whether it's, you know, who's carrying that risk, there's a cash flow issue here. Um, an insurance company can't be sitting, if it knows that it's got to pay out within 48 hours, it will not be doing what a typical insurance company does and invest its capital into long-dated assets and you know, earn a return. It actually will have to put in place a credit facility with somebody who does have access to cash um, and it, to be able to bring that cash forward. So if you think about that, then if what we need is a really fast-acting uh, cash machine, then you will need effectively um, the ATM, something that can issue money very, very quickly. That brings you to two things. You can't have a new issuer, because if it's a brand new issuer, no one's ever heard of this thing. It suddenly announces we're going to do the Ebola bond. Everybody may like it, but if it's not a credit that's on their list of names they can buy, it, it can't issue. So we have talked about whether IFIM could, could do some of this, and where you have a, um, a pandemic like influenza, where there is a vaccine solution, then this sort of seems obvious to kind of try and have some capital, a bit like Paolo said, that is sort of contingent and can be called on. But now you have a known issuer that can go into the market. It's a pandemic bond, but people say, ultimately, the credit is something I know. The other people who have access, obviously, is the World Bank, I mean, or, a, or an MDB, a, a, a known entity can, can come into the market or the commercial banking sector. Um, banks can, you can put standby facilities in place with banks who can immediately provide that liquidity. So if we really want fast cash, I'm saying there's, it's a capital markets product, and you either uh, have an intermediary like an insurance company in the, in the front who then has to have that capital market solution behind it, 
or you can just put that, put that in place. So that's a, a long way of saying that I think IFIM demonstrates the sort of the two bits of IFIM actually are in a way the two bits you need, one for a pandemic and one for, a, um, for a, um, the surveillance and, and putting the place in, things in place. Okay, that's great. That's, that's very interesting indeed. So 